Hey everyone, today I want to talk about Bausha Potemkin from 1925 by Sergei Eisenstein. This is the 35th episode of my 1000 Favorite Movie series, where I talk about the movies I love the most in a random order. Coincidentally, the first Russian movie I'll talk about is probably the most famous one ever made, containing what might be the single most studied scene in history, the Odessa Steppe sequence. It's of course a great and riveting scene, but I get the feeling that for many, especially for film professors and students, the whole movie basically just boils down to this scene, the other hour plus be damned. I guess this is understandable, considering the limited amount of time offered to film courses to basically condense the vast reaches of movie history to a single semester, but it still feels unfair to this remarkable movie to basically disregard most of it. Anyway, let's get into why I love the whole movie. This is, of course, a propaganda film, but as I try to communicate in my video about I Am Cuba, I don't view propaganda as inherently negative in terms of art. If artfully done, they can make you feel energized no matter what the cause. While usually not subtle, they can be exhilarating, dramatic experiences. But what makes Palsha Potemkin interesting, for one, is that unlike movies like I Am Cuba and Eisenstein's Later October, it's a propaganda film about a previous failed revolution, the 1905 Russian Revolution. This not only makes it seem more like a historical drama, where it's less about pumping you up and more about presenting a historical event, but it also adds a certain sense of melancholy and defeat, more of an emotional element as opposed to just simply celebrating and commemorating an unmitigated triumph. We do see triumphs, but we also see plenty of tragedy in equal measure. But most importantly, the movie deals with human emotions and fighting for dignity against a powerful authority, which lends a movie a broad universal appeal that extends well beyond the one historical moment it depicts. I think the best way to approach this movie is to go through all of its five sections one by one, which all have different focuses and flavors. The first one, called Men and Maggots, is basically the introduction to the problems of our heroes. It's about the crew of the battleship Potemkin, as they suffer under the cruel conditions of the ship. The main concern is the food, and how they're given rotten meat to eat. They complain and have the doctor inspect it, but in a brilliant and gross shot, he looks at the meat up close with his glasses, and we see it crawling with maggots, yet he still declares it to be good meat. Of course, the crew refuse to eat it, instead eating anything else they can find and buy from the ship's store. It's all kind of a symphonic buildup to a scene of a dishwasher finding a dish that says, give us this day our daily bread, and smashing it out of frustration. The next section is called Drama on the Deck. It's the longest section, and it shows a mutiny take place. It starts with the grotesque officers and captains wanting those who didn't eat the meat to be executed. Eventually, after a lot of bodies moving around on the deck that I frankly don't really understand too well, a group of sailors is to be shot by the guards, but they refuse to shoot, and thus begins one of Eisenstein's montage set pieces that he's famous for. The sailors all grab guns and chaos ensues as they fight on the deck, throwing the officers off the ship, and they even fight in the captain's quarters with the piano and everything. We also get a sense of Eisenstein's geometrical shot compositions, from the different formations that are formed on the deck with the cannons in the foreground, to this triangular shot where we get three levels of people running in different directions, to the various shapes of the ship's structures. We also get our first tragedy, where the leader of the rebellion is shot and killed, and the section ends with his body being brought into the harbor and placed in a tent with a sign that reads, For a spoonful of borscht. The third section, A Dead Man Calls Out, is about the attention the body receives in Odessa as people slowly start to gather. The atmosphere of the early morning is remarkable, where we slowly get only a handful of people noticing at first, but as the day progresses, countless people come to visit. Some of my favorite shots of the movie include this mass of people making the journey, especially the shot on this long, winding bridge with a huge amount of extras. This slow-moving camera movement, as it slowly reveals just how many people there are, should disprove the superficial idea that these silent Soviet directors are only about fast-paced montage. The people at the body get charged up with thoughts of revolution, and they start to cheer and support Potemkin as they make the commitment to revolution by raising a red flag. Next is the fourth and most famous section, the Odessa Steps. It starts off very beautifully, with many small boats going to the battleship to give supplies. It's a nice, peaceful atmosphere, and everyone is happily waving from the land. But suddenly, like a bolt of lightning, people start running and screaming. Even though we all know this is coming, 
it still comes as a surprise after almost a hundred years after its release because of just how short Eisenstein lets the peacefulness last. Anyway, it's a marvelous and tragic sequence of soldiers marching down the steps shooting civilians and shows the brutality of the situation with fabulous formal and narrative techniques. Many of the best edits are cuts to and from people's reactions to the chaos around them, like of this woman, for example, whose son just got shot. Another result of the fast editing is that we don't really get much perspective of the situation. For example, the staircase seems like it'll last forever and people just keep running and running, even though the steps aren't actually that long in reality when we see a wide shot of it. We also don't sense much of the relation between the soldiers and the citizens, seeming more like an abstract force than anything else, except for a couple of shots in particular of this woman carrying her son to try and convince them to stop shooting which really has an impact due to the soldiers and citizens finally confronting each other face to face. There are also brilliant camera movements and compositions here, like the camera moving down along with the running crowd, and it's easy to forget that there's even a brief POV shot of a collapsing civilian where the camera quickly pans down. I also, ironically, love the shots of the soldiers, like the first shot we see of them with the statue in the foreground, or the ones that show them in a straight line moving like robots, which is a very influential composition, being parodied in, just to name one example in a movie I've already reviewed, Clueless, where we see the poorly dressed guys walking in a line in unison. I bet you didn't expect me to mention that movie. Anyway, this also has great narrative techniques, starting with the basic one of everyone running downstairs, enabling constant movement and somewhat of an endpoint, as opposed to like people just running around or something. It also, of course, shows that the government has crushing power over the citizens, as they're literally coming down on them. But what really makes this memorable are the subplots, like the woman carrying her boy like I mentioned earlier, or even better, the baby carriage sequence. It's extremely dramatic as the mother slowly dies after getting shot, clutching her body, while we see the carriage teetering on the edge. This happens very slowly, raising the suspense, but then the carriage finally gets pushed on the steps. I think this is utterly genius, seeing the baby carriage run down the stairs along with the crowd, having us invest in a single character this innocent baby, among a scene about the masses, creating intense symbolic and dramatic richness. As you can tell, I think this scene deserves every bit of fame it has. But the section isn't even over after the iconic final shot. In retaliation, Potemkin fires his cannons at the general's headquarters, destroying it. But while this is happening, we cut to three shots of three different line statues, and the order makes it look like the line is rising up. It's a brief but amazing few shots that exemplify the montage theory in a concise way. Finally, there's a fifth section, Rendezvous with the Squadron. In some ways, this is the most straightforward section, but in other ways, it's the most challenging. It's about Potemkin deciding to face the enemy squadron and the suspense up until that moment. We get the nighttime with people sleeping and on watch, then it slowly turns into daytime, and then everyone has to prepare to attack. In a movie called Battleship Potemkin, this is where we finally start seeing some battleship action we might have been expecting, as the ship's finally moving for the first time that we see, and we see the process of getting ready to fight. This whole process lasts a long time, but always with amazing and beautiful shots, so we enjoy it. Well, when the suspense is at its highest, and we don't know whether they'll be fighting, it turns out there won't be, as everyone on both sides rush to the decks and wave to each other in solidarity, allowing the Potemkin to pass. It's a happy ending, but to me it's challenging in that it's frankly difficult to follow, at least on first viewing, mostly from being confused as to which ship is which, and also how they know the other squadron has accepted them. When we go back and study it, we can figure it out, but it all happened so fast that I was befuddled the first time I saw it. It's also confusing because it looks like the ship's decks changed over the course of the movie, going from this one to this one. But that aside, it's a riveting ending, seeing all the sailors rush out onto the deck and throw their hats in the air in jubilee, and with the great last shot of the camera going under the ship. Hopefully, by going through the whole movie, I have shown that the film has many different stories that can be considered universal, such as fighting for basic human rights, rebellion, grieving, tragedy, joy, suspense about upcoming battle, and more. There are also much smaller examples of human emotions, like when after an officer whips a sailor while he's in his hammock, and he turns over and weeps in his pillow. I don't want to pretend that the movie's without propagandistic context, as there are conversations about the larger revolution happening across Russia. The villains literally couldn't be any more one-dimensional if they tried, and there's absolutely no room for ambiguity about the events on screen. 
but there's an undeniable human element that makes this movie such a classic, still worth watching today. Now for my favorite moments. One has got to be this guy, this religious figure with a cool cross and crazy hair, shot here in a fiery shot with smoke in the background. Seeing him is exciting, but he's so over the top that I can't help but be amused. He adds a religious context to the movie that goes over my head, but he seems to be pining for the death of the sailors just as much as the officers are. The best part is when he goes up to one of the sailors after the fighting is broken out and waves a cross at him like he's a demon or something. My subtitles say, beat it, sorcerer, and he grabs him, making him just collapse to the ground, and his face just makes me laugh. I mean, the scene is basically a comedy routine. Shortly after, he takes a tumble down the stairs, which is also a little funny, but does have some feeling of symbolic impact, like even the forces of religion don't stand a chance against the rebels. But later, he opens his eyes and looks around for a couple of seconds, then, like, goes back to sleep. We've already assumed that he's dead, but now I guess he was just pretending to be dead? I guess he's just messing with everyone. For me, this character is just pure comic relief. I've already mentioned some shots that I love, and here's another one that stands out. After the sailor gets shot during the mutiny, he falls on this thing, and I like when the crew tries to rescue him. He's dangling on this vertical line in the foreground, and the crew jump from this horizontal line in the background. It's just really cool perspective, and a super clean composition. I've already mentioned big moments and cool shots that I like, but I just want to highlight this one very tiny shot that maybe only I find interesting. I don't know. It's near the end of the movie as the ship's preparing for battle. It's this shot, where the guy who's manning the turn in the middle does this kind of robot-like motion that looks a little like a dance, and also a little like he's a piece of machinery. It then cuts to someone holding this cannon missile thing. It's a very appealing cut to me, maybe because it matches the machine-like motions of this guy. Like I said, it's very tiny, but I think it's fascinating. But in the end, what I love about Balsha Potemkin is that it manages to be more than just a propaganda film. I think it's very easy to separate it from its historical context and view it as a rousing entertainment, both on a technical and dramatic level. It's certainly high in the running for being my favorite piece of silent Soviet cinema. It's one of my 1,000 favorite movies. Thanks for watching my video. Have you seen Balsha Potemkin? Let me know what you think in the comments. I think of all my favorite movies as friends, and I think of my audience as friends too. Remember, I upload a new video every Friday, so if you want to help me complete this 1000 favorite movies epic, don't forget to like and subscribe.